counterattack. This is a quick and dirty rules overview, 30 minutes or less. Suitable for your board game group. It's really for mine. Setting, Europe, Africa, Middle East, 350 AD. Late Roman Empire. We can see the Romans in red and magenta all through here. Massive migrations of people from the east to the west, north to the south. Those are, in general, barbarians, as the Romans would call them. We can see some on the map already. Got the Franks over here, got the Alemanni here, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Alans, more are coming. Every turn, more barbarians are coming on. The general play of the game is there are civilized nations, and I'm not showing all of them. For example, to the east of Rome are their arch enemies, the Persians, who are also a civilized nation. These guys are just trying to hold on to what they have. The barbarians, they want what they have. They want to take it. Over time, barbarians will come in, take territory, and settle down, slowly become civilized. They will turn into civilized people, become sort of like the Romans and Persians, only to be attacked by the next wave of barbarians that want their nice civilized stuff. It's a general idea. It's an 11 to 12 turn game, four players. Unlike a lot of games where each player plays one nation, well, we're going to be playing many nations. This is a listing of all the nations in the base game that each player gets. You can see the players are called the Romans and the Huns, but really just call them red and green because they play lots of different nations. Every nation has a card sort of telling you like what makes it, what makes them tick. For example, here's the Persians. Uh, what makes them tick? Well, there's this little victory point schedule down here. You can see they hate Romans and they get victory points for killing Romans. They get 20 victory points if they do a giant attack against Rome each turn. On turns 3, 6, and 9 in the last turn of the game, all nations score victory points for territory. So almost every nation you'll see 3, 6, 9, E for end, and it has places they want to capture. If you look through these, these are like, I want all the Rome stuff, I want all the Rome stuff, I want all the Rome stuff. Okay, so, and you can see there's a bunch of different victory points depending on the situation. Now that was the Persians, and you know, they want all the Rome stuff, but barbarians, which is the majority kind of nation, like these are the uh, Franks or the Franchi, Franchi. Um, they, they want things a little bit different. They, they still want, I want all of Rome stuff, I want all of Rome stuff. But these guys are like, well, I want, I want, I want France. I heard it's cool, which is why I'm named Franchi. But uh, yeah, I want, I want all of France, try to take it and keep it. Interestingly, this is a red nation. You know who else is red? Rome. Interesting. The Romans are con con controlling their own enemy. Yep, that's a little weird. It happens. The point of the game, you control all your nations that you're assigned, get as many victory points as you can for every nation, add them all up at the end of the game, whoever has the most victory points wins. Sometimes you have weird stuff going on. Here's the high level sequence of play. Looks like a lot of stuff, don't panic. There's basically, each turn, there's a time phase. That's basically some kind of bookkeeping phase that every nation in the game has to take care of something. Administration phase, that's another bookkeeping phase, but just for civilized nations like the Romans and the Persians. Basically, they collect income and purchase stuff. Barbarians don't have to do that. Barbarians are simpler to play. Military phase, this is the meat of the game. This is bulk of the time is spent in the game, moving, combat, sieges, score. Every third turn, roughly, score victory points for territory. Let's ignore that bookkeeping stuff. We'll get to it. Let's jump in. Military phase, meat of the game. I think we need to go over some terminology before I can describe how to do movement, combat, and sieges, though. Let's zoom in a little. Okay, here we go. Everything on the map, except for a few, like, random markers here or there, they are combat units, essentially. There are Lemus. Um, I guess Limitus is plural. The, these are the fortifications Rome built along their border. There are combat units. This one's an infantry. The little icons indicate their extra capabilities beyond just being a boring infantry. There's cavalry. Um, there are leaders. Here's a couple leaders here. There are cities. These, this big fat red city, that's like a capital. Um, over here is a city. Um, it has a little scalloping around it. That indicates it's a fortified city with a minus two roll modifier. Fortified cities are important. Down here we got just a boring old unfortified city. We throw down markers to make the fortified cities stick out a little better. There's also these little like uh, little pads where you can like build new cities. So 
Not every place is allowed to have a city. Each of these provinces, which is what these places are, has a little tiny name in it and a red number. This is a half. Um, the red number is the economic value of the province. Also note the cities, they have a red number on them too. That's the economic value of the city. It also happens to be the city size. So this one up here has a two in it. That's a size two city and its economic value is two. You may have noted the things that I call provinces. They're color coded, like these are all green with little trees in them. That's because those are forest provinces. Over here, some clear provinces, brown mountain provinces. There are also some border terrain. For example, the rivers here, these are called ridges, these uh, mountainy looking things. Um, there's also uh, water in the game. Let's uh, cruise up up here by Britain. All right, these are sea zones, much bigger than the provinces in general. Some of them have a little boat with a red number, red number, economic value. Then in this case, it indicates whoever controls this sea zone, like fully controls it, gets a little bonus of one gold. Some cities have anchor symbols on them right when they're on the water. Those cities are coastal cities, they're ports. Cities that don't have an anchor on them but are on the water are not coastal cities or ports. Now provinces are the things we're going to care about most, but on top of that, provinces are grouped into things called areas. They're kind of hard to see. After a while you get used to spotting them. So an area has a really big name in it. Here we go, Gallia Sep, which means Gallia Sep. Um, Northern Gaul, I guess, something like that. Uh, little pink hash marks. See, follow my marker here. Little pink hash marks. So this is Gallia Sep. And along this river, it gets hard when there's a lot of terrain, but along this river, so Gallia Sep up here, and then Gallia Mare down here. Germania over here. So those are areas. And areas are categorized into two types of areas. It's right next to the name. A little Greek column, how civilized. That's a civilized area. Just think of it as places where there's like, people have been living in cities and stuff a long time, right? And then another kind, this little ax here for chopping up Romans, that is a barbarian area. And just like there are civilized nations, the Romans, Romans and barbarian nations, the Alamanni, there are civilized areas, barbarian areas. Okay, so anyway, Meat of the game, military phase, what do we do? In nation activation order, nations activate and they do military stuff. What's nation activation order? Let's go check out the Avum track. Hey, here's the Avum track. I didn't say Ovum, I said Avum, which means age. So when you're doing nation activation order, you go to the Avum track, go to the barbarian part of it, Find the oldest barbarian tribe. This is how old the barbarians are. So these guys are two years old, or two seasons old, whatever. Pick the oldest barbarian, they go. Then after the oldest barbarians go, the next oldest and so on. Then later, uh, when you run out of barbarians, you go to the civilized nations. You start with kingdoms. How do you know which one of these are kingdoms? You don't, they forgot to print a little eagle for the non-kingdoms, anyway. You'll just know, Persia's a kingdom, Western and Eastern Rome, they're empires. You just know that. So then kingdoms go next. Go through all the kingdoms, empires next. Start with the oldest, go to the youngest. Rome is a little special on turn one. Each nation has a little cheat sheet of special rules and some of the bigger nations like Rome have some. Rome, East and West are allied. They activate as if they're one nation, even though they're really two. And you go with the older nation in that case. So they're actually a nine in, on turn one. Hey, uh, look, there's a stack of barbarians. I'm so confused. How do I know which ones go first? Well, you go grab their little barbarian cards. Hello. And whoever has the lowest initiative value, four, Alamani, go first. Isn't that nice? So let's say, yeah, we're activating. We're activating the Alamani, nation activation order. They're the first guys. Cool. Now, before they activate, professional courtesy, tell everyone, hey, Alamani, activating. Because there are diplomatic things that can happen, and they have to happen before the source or the target of a diplomatic overture is going to happen. For example, if someone's going to propose a marriage with someone, the proposer and the proposee, um, that proposal has to be done before either one of them activate. So, so Alamani are like, hey, I'm about to activate. Anyone want to, like 
diplomatize me. Some nations are going to have little diplomacy cards, and they're going to be like, yeah, I want to diplom diplomatize you, okay? But sometimes not. Now, empires. Empires got some special thing. They can fit us them. <laughs> That's Latin for something I can't pronounce. I call it federate. So, an empire can always offer to a barbarian nation on their border that has a horde on the border. That's the horde. Looks like a dude with a cow, but it's really like their entire civilization. Uh, you say, hey, hey, uh, how about this? Instead of attacking me and taking all my stuff, how about you come live in Rome? Hey, I will give you two provinces on my border. You live there. You're kind of like my buddy. You, you guard the border. You know, you give me money. You give me some troops. I'll let you stay there. We'll be neutral to each other. That's an option. Every empire can offer that once per turn to one nation. Sometimes there's barbarian, or, uh, diplomacy cards that you can do, get more than one out of a turn. But they might say, hey, yeah, uh, I don't want you to invade me. Hey, I offer you Fittus. And why, why would the Alamani do that? They hate the red player. They're, they're from the green player. I hate you. Well, every turn that they are under a Fittus gives them three points. So it's like a free three victory points every turn while they're a Fittus. And they can always like figure out a way to get out from under it, I would say. But... You know, when you're uh, activating, that's when you want to do it. Other kind of diplomatic thing that might go on when someone activates is a barbarian in a barbarian area. It's sort of like neutral ground. Barbarians are kind of like chill. They're, yeah, we're just barbarying it up out in our little Germania. They're mutually neutral to each other by default. However, when they activate, other barbarians anywhere can say, I'm hostile, I hate the Alamani, which will let the Alamani on their turn go fight them if they want. If no one declares hostility, the Alamani cannot go attack another barbarian. You can only attack barbarians that have already announced hostility. Those rules don't apply once you're in the civilized area. Once you're in civilized area, it's barbarous. You can go attack anyone you want. Okay, so let's use the activation of the Alamani as an example of the military phase, okay? so. Hey, I'm activating, no one plays diplomacy card. Although uh, these guys might be like, well, technically I hate you because, hey, let's look at our little victory points. I hate Romans and I want to take France. I hate Romans and I want to take France. By the way, by the way I hate Franks. Um, but, you know, they don't, they don't want to get in a scrap with these guys. They don't look as strong, you know, if you dig in there. Um, so everyone's like, yeah, we're cool. We're cool. Okay, Alemani, they want to go do some stuff. Right now, they would just start moving. There's a, some, there's a step in the military phase called the unit stacks step. And that's where all your units as stacks move. They move um, as far as short as the movement allowance of their units allow. If they enter into a combat situation, they have to stop. And then once everyone's done moving, you go resolve all the combat situations. There's a few other things to that. but. These guys don't have a particular situation that you have to do before you do your unit stack step. So let's go check out what the Romans have in the Middle East as an example of the situation I'm talking about. Here we are in the Middle East. Let's pretend it's not the Alemanni activating. It's the, Ro the Romans, specifically the Eastern Romans. They have a couple clients. I know they have clients because there's a little Byzantine client marker on Armenia. So at the start of the game, Armenia, this is an independent minor kingdom. They're basically like a NPC, AI, whatever. They don't actually do anything. If someone attacks them, someone will roll dice for them. If they have to retreat, someone will decide where they retreat to. But otherwise, they're a friend of the Romans. Let me take that back. They are a client of the Romans. They're not a friend. At some point in the past, the Romans had defeated them in battle and made them a neutral client. These guys give Rome money, they give Rome troops, and as part of the contract they agree to be completely neutral to each other. But at the start of the military phase, if you have a client, your client is going to give you a military unit on loan as part of their subservience package. So you basically just randomly choose one of the military units they have, let's say this one was selected, and then you can go put it anywhere in your territory with your troops and pretend it's Roman for the rest of the turn. At the end of your military phase, you give it back. If it's dead, eh, you don't really care.
So, back to the Alemanni. These guys don't have any clients, but they want to do stuff. Just trust me that they want a bunch of stuff in France. But to get into France, they got to fight the Romans. You got decisions to make, right? You actually don't score victory points for territory until turn three, and then six, and nine, and then the last turn. So maybe you don't want to go in right now. You want to see what the Romans do. But, you know, we got to learn how to fight, so we're going to make them fight. Unit stack step, all your units move in stacks. Let's talk about how far units can move. There's an infantry, it's a little man icon. They can go three paces, that's just three provinces. There's no detriment to moving. You don't have to spend more to go in the woods or cross a river. Um, oh, all they have is infantry. I bet these guys have some more interesting stuff over here. Um, nope. <laughs> okay, just trust me, there's cavalry somewhere. They move four paces instead of three. If your units move with a leader, their entire move, they get a plus one. So that's nice. So, so infantry can go four, cavalry five. The horde. The horde can go three, or if it goes to the leader, plus one. Note that there is another kind of barbarian out there. They're called nomads. The Alani are nomads. The only way you know that you look on their little card, it's got a little horse head with a bow. They're nomads. Their hordes are faster. They go four instead of three. I guess you can think of them as being cavalry horde. Anyway, details. Okay, let's do the lamest move I could ever do. I'm just going to move one infantry. One, two, three. Bam. Done. I could declare my unit stack step is over. That'd be pretty boring, right? Let's talk about a better move. Well, how many units can I stack? It's called the unit stack step. You can stack up to four units in any province, unless it's mountains, which is three units. What do we have in here? Well, leaders don't count to stacking, they're free. Limas, limitas don't count for stacking, they're free, as well as cities and things. But uh, how many infantry do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six infantry and a horde. Hordes don't count towards stacking. But six infantry, I just told you only four could stack there. Well, at the beginning of the game, you're allowed to violate stacking rules if the rules tell you to set up lots of guys in one province. But also, I get this little plus two on Vadomorus. Vadomorus. That's his stacking bonus. So he can actually allow six units to stack instead of the normal four. Let's do another boring move. He's got infantry only, so they can go three. But if they travel with him the whole way, they can go four. Woo! Hey, as you're going, you can drop stuff off if you want. Cool. Uh, you can also go the other way and pick them back up. <laughs> if you're going in that direction. Just as long as no one goes above the movement allowance they're allowed. Um, maybe you go like this. this. is a silly move, right? So I finished moving a stack and I dropped stuff along the way. Nothing stops you from like, hey, these guys haven't spent their movement points. They're not spent. Unlike many games where... Like, once you stop touching the playing piece, it's done. Nope. So, uh, this guy went one. Well, he's going to go two, three. He can't go four because he's not with his leader anymore. Maybe this guy's like, hey, I'll catch up with you. Two, three. You know? Uh, you can do all kinds of things. Reasons to keep stacks together is the enemy might intercept. And if you're just moving a little guy trying to catch up with a bigger stack, so the enemy might try to intercept and kill him easily. The reason you might want to move little guys is to try to get a big stack to try to intercept you, but away from your main attack. So, because you can do these things in different orders. Let's get these guys back together. We'll talk about interception in a minute, but let's cover a few other simpler things. Okay, let's just say this guy's here, and the Franks declared their hostility to the Alemanni. And let's just say these guys aren't here. So there's just like one lone Frank out there, okay? This stack of six infantry and their leader. They might go one, two, and you can flee. We'll cover that in a minute. You can try to flee, but let's just say he doesn't flee or he fails to flee. These guys are like, hey, I have six infantry. You have one infantry. I guess six units, one unit. Overrun squash. It's a free kill if you have a six to one advantage. 
you have to spend an extra movement point to do it. So they went one, two, three to squash, four. So be careful about your little units because a big stack can come across and just squash them. Let's do another example. Say we only had four units. We can't squash that guy, but I really want to get some units over here. We go one, two, he chooses not to flee. I'm going to do a passage in force. You leave double the number of units he has in the province. They're sort of suppressing him, right? They're hold, pinning him down and then the rest can go through. Let's say I had these guys over here, right? They showed up later. Well, now that this guy's pinned, one, two, three, just cruise right on through. Now there will be a combat here. These guys are stuck and they're gonna have to combat later, but they did their job. They let the, the force get through. Okay, I've reset some things. Now um, let's, let's go over flight. Okay, let's say these guys are like, hello, we're gonna go one, two, okay? These guys could try to flee. I won't go into the die roll modifiers. Well, you should look at that when you play the game. But uh, they're gonna roll the die and try to flee. It's um, not too hard. And if they flee, they can run away up to three spaces. So uh, one, two, three, bam, yay. This guy can try to chase him down, but um, in this case, uh, maybe it just stops there. Maybe these guys just go there, who knows? But um, you can try to flee. Now let's say all of Germania is owned by the Franks. It's not, but let's just say that. And we entered this province. It's a Frankish province that these guys just flee from. Well, an enemy may attempt to intercept when their enemy enters one of their controlled provinces. So this is a contr Frankish controlled province. We'll talk about how things are controlled and lost and stuff, but uh, let's just say it's controlled. So the Franks would be like, hey, I want to intercept. Let's just say a little more complicated. This guy was here. The Franks can say, I want to intercept and I want to flee. You can choose one or the other first. You can see how the outcome is. Then you can do the other. So let's say he's like, well, um, I want to intercept, fail. Okay, well, I want to flee, right? Maybe he flees first. These guys roll. Intercepting is similar to flight. You roll a die. You can intercept within three spaces. So you can intercept pretty far compared to other games. There are rules for how to intercept in the sense that you have to announce all the units that will intercept. You're limited to a single unit that doesn't have a, or sorry, a single stack that doesn't have a leader. So I could say this guy's gonna intercept, not after he fleed, but, um, and as many stacks with leaders as you like. So if this was a situation when these guys moved in, I could say he's gonna try to intercept and he's gonna try to intercept. Roll dice and see what happens. If they intercept, there is nothing the Alemanni can do. Let's just say both succeeded. Nothing they can do. If the, uh, a battle is going to be fought right now, we don't wait to the end of the mo unit stacks movement step, uh, which is when you normally do all the combat. You do it right now as part of interception. If the Alemanni win the battle, they can keep moving if they still have movement points. They don't lose any movement points for fighting or anything. If they lose the battle, they're, well, they're either gone or they're going to have to retreat and they'll be done. A little more. If these guys move into a Lemus, a Roman fortification, they have to stop. Done. Lemus stop you in your tracks. You will then do a combat. Let's say they went into here, but this Lemus wasn't here. It's just a fortified city. Here, we'll do that. Walk over there. We're in the fortified city. When you're in a city location, that's an enemy, you have to do one of three things. You have to stop and siege it to capture it. Or move on if you still have movement points or retreat one to three spaces and end your movement. So if I said, eh, I want to siege this, done. He's done moving. Got to wait for the combat phase where you do sieges. All right, we're ready to fight. All right, let's fight. Let's pick something garbage here. We're going to move in. We're going to take our horde with us. Hordes cannot do combat on the attack, but they can still move with you. You don't want to leave your horde by itself. That is bad, which we'll talk about later. 
But let's move in here. We want to go here, maybe. Yeah, you know, they get lots of points for Lotharingia, if I remember correctly. So maybe if I was really playing, I'd go there. Okay, that stops me in my tracks. But uh, the Romans might want to intercept. This guy's one, two, three spaces away. Yep, I'm intercepting. This guy's one space away. I'm intercepting. This guy's one, two, three spaces away, but I've already announced a leaderless stack is going to intercept, so he can't. If I had a leader here, he could try to intercept. All right, let's just say interception was wonderful. These guys got in. Yay, these guys got in. Bam. Let's go see what a battle looks like. Remember, during the unit stack step, you move all your stacks, then battles happen. Unless there's an interception, in which case you like pause, resolve the interception battle, and then continue. Okay, here we are. We're ready for battle. I encourage you to lay out your uh, troops like you're playing Rome Total War and even make little sound effects and stuff. So, uh, but anyway, here we go. Okay, first thing you do, do we have any archers? If there's any archers, there's going to be an archery round. There aren't any. I know that because I'm looking for little archer symbols on the units, kind of like the horse head symbol here. There aren't any, but there would be an archery round. Here's the... Uh, Advanced combat rules, which is the only rules we play when we do in combat, right? And, uh, you know, it tells you how to do the archery round, add up some tyro modifiers, roll, guys take losses. Fun. All right. Nice, nice and easy. Then there's going to be a melee round where these guys go at it, take losses. If one side still survives, or both sides still survive, the uh, defender has the option to retreat one to three spaces. If they choose not to, the attacker can choose to retreat one to three spaces. If they're both sticking it out, another round of melee then it's over players are going to have some event cards they won't have a lot but they'll have some event cards they might want to play it you know sometimes they'll say hey during a battle the enemy's mule ate a bunch of figs and doesn't have any wine right and then minus one die roll something like that so uh keep that in mind oh you know i don't know what happened there's some kind of technical difficulty where the horde went missing and also the uh lemus all right um back up a little before the archery round blah 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 when these guys entered the location with the lemus there weren't any romans there right then the romans declared they're gonna intercept and they were successful but before that even happened the lemus stops them in their tracks and blows up it's destroyed and they have to make a d2 die roll how do you make a d2 die roll do you flip a coin no you roll a d10 if it's even they take a loss. So let's just say I rolled, bam, I rolled an eight, even, take a loss, flip it over. Ouch. You gotta keep track of your victory points as you go though, because uh, check it out. One VP for each barbarian killed. Roma's just got a victory point. And then all the money are like, hey dude, I just destroyed this like Lemus. Does that count? The answer, yes. Each Roman eliminated. One point each. Doing good. Next. You add up the die roll modifiers for each side. Here's a bunch of stuff. We're not going to go over it. Basically, modifiers for the terrain. Modifiers for having more heavy infantry than the other guy. Having a heavy advantage. This little shields are heavy infantry. Whoever has like a substantial amount of cavalry over the other guy. Like this guy's two against zero. That will count as cavalry bonus. There's bonuses for having... Elite guys, so that's a little diamonds are. There's, there's a bunch of things like that. Add them all up. There's a few other choices to make. Roll dice. Bam. You see what's going on here. Combat results table this is why it's so advanced. Look at how many units you had. If you rolled like a seven, you do two and a half losses to the enemy. You round that up if you're in clear desert or step. If you're not in clear desert or step, you don't round up. It's just two or two and a half. Both sides do that. Take losses. Let's say these guys, like, these guys took two losses and these guys took two losses. This guy's like, ouch. You know, these ones don't really matter. They're all the same. Ouch, ouch. That's two more points to the Romans. So the Romans, they have fewer units, but they are fancy. They're fancy. The diamonds are elite units. Besides giving a little bit of bonus, they're two-sided. So if I flip this guy over to take a hit, he's still alive. He's just no longer, like, cool. So I could go something like this let's kill him off okay so let's say that happened then we're like do you want to do you want to um, retreat these guys are the attacker actually so let me go over here do you want to retreat um no these guys are the defender because 
they intercepted. They get to the province before these guys arrive. That's why they're the defender. Then, hey, do you guys want to retreat? Let's just say yes, they retreat. Okay, let's just say that happened. It's good to keep your losses on the board like this. Maybe the limitus will be like this. Just keep track of your losses. Because at the end of a battle, if it's a big battle, and it's a big battle if there's more than two units on, each, on one of the sides, or on both sides, more than two units on both sides, you get to recover. Each side gets to recover two units. So these guys come back. These guys, they didn't actually, oh yeah, they lost one unit. So he comes back. Um, so I'll make him not 45 degrees. Lemus, Lemus don't come back. Okay, so he recovered one unit, he recovered two. And then if you are civilized, you can recover, or sorry, restore one elite unit. So this guy's like, Yep, I want to restore one elite unit. So at the end of the battle, only one guy died. You'll see over time, like, this isn't always the case where both sides have almost nothing. Like, it gets bad. And then if the battle was like this, that's a small battle. Two units on one side. That's a small battle. There's only one unit to recover. And then if there's only one unit on the side, and these don't count as units, uh, no one recovers. So you got to be careful on those small battles. In this scenario, we're going to say the Romans won. These guys chose to retreat, I should say. Yeah, they chose to retreat. Hey, I'm making them too battered, though, right? Like, I think we're, I don't know, it was like this, right? Um, if all were wiped out, though, we'd have to roll to see if he dies. If the last hit in a defensive or offensive battle hits the horde, and you always choose your own units to be hit, if it hits the horde, the barbarian tribe submits. That doesn't sound nice, does it? They submit to the guy that just hit them. That's bad. That converts them into a vassal, which is like a fetus without respect. So you don't want that. It's a good thing to try to do to other people. Hey, uh, every time an empire wins a battle, the leader... If, if the leader of the empire is taking part in the battle, that's who this guy is, there's a chance he's assassinated. Why? Because people back then were crazy. So anyway, got to be careful with your leader when he goes into battle. A little more on this. Like, I'm kind of skipping over some details, right? But hey, what's this guy do? Why, why do I even care about this guy in my battle? This number here, this three. Same with this dude. He's got a two. Those are the number of re-rolls. So, in the first round, they re they roll their dice. Then, starting with the attacker, which are these guys, you ask him, hey, do you want to use one of your re-rolls to re-roll the dice? You can re-roll your dice or order the enemy to re-roll their dice. So he's like, yeah, you re roll your dice. So they re-roll. This guy's like, now it's his turn. Well, I don't like what I just rolled. I'm going to re-roll myself. Oh, that's great. Hey, re-roll again. Um, I rolled great. You re-roll. <laughs> Back and forth, right? Um, a die roll modifier during a melee round can give you plus two die roll modifier if you sacrifice one re-roll. So there's a little extra bonus for having leaders if you don't care about re-rolls. Like let's say you roll a 12 and no one's going to make you not re-roll. Yeah, go ahead and sacrifice a re-roll. Anyway, enough about that. Kind of rough overview. So after the battle, you know, we're pretending these guys lost. They go, they retreat. They can retreat one, two, or three. You always have to retreat from where you came. If you came in from many locations, you have to retreat back to those many locations. Let's say that if this guy is really weak, you know, maybe he wants to retreat really far to stay away from the Romans, because the Romans are going to try to get, get, his, get his horde to vassalize him, humiliate him. But just remember, when you're retreating back here, there's, there's other guys coming in, and if they're hostile to you, they're going to get your horde. In fact, just a little side comment. All these little guys, there's three little tribes up here. They're all the same color. They are inactive they're like npcs they got three hordes they're really easy to get it's quite likely this guy when he activates he's gonna go get all three of those hordes and vassalize all of them vassals are nice because they give you a unit so if this guy takes out three three tribes he gets three units from them they also give you half the victory points that they would normally get for territory but hey who cares about those guys I'm talking about the alamani here all right, well, they didn't have a lot of units, so they're like done, right? Units stacked up, done. If they had other units, we'd have to go through all the other combats they did, but done. 
Are they done with their military phase? No, because they have a leader. Leaders, after the unit stack step, go on leader campaigns. In fact, you can go on multiple. This guy can go on two leader campaigns. This guy, three. The way you do a leader campaign is you take your leader stack, it teleports anywhere within your territory, and then you do like a unit stack step, but just for your leader stack. There is a little side rule like units next to the stack can like sort of get absorbed into a stack. But uh, essentially, yes, you go on a little mini unit stack step. With the Alemanni, it's not really obvious like how that's different from just unit stacks. But consider the Romans. They have a giant territory. So on Julianus's leader stack step, he gets three. His first one, he might go... I'm gonna, let's say that was Roman territory. Just teleport all the way over to Mesopotamia area to go attack Persia, right? Then he has a second unit stack step. Um, maybe he uh, teleports, oh, you know, over to here, soaks up some other units, moves a little, attacks. Third, maybe he wants to keep attacking, or, you know, maybe you better get back to a safe place. So he'll like go uh, teleport, you know, back to here. So it's very flexible, and sometimes nations have multiple leaders. So uh, that's the leader campaigns. Just remember, when your leader, if an empire wins a battle, someone might get uppity and want to assassinate him. Got pretty much covered all battles, but you know the part I didn't cover was uh, sieges. Okay, so let's just say there are a bunch of battles and stuff, and then these guys at the end of either the leader campaign or at the end of the unit stack step, they're stuck here in an enemy city. It doesn't matter that it's fortified. Any enemy city, it's got to gotta be besieged. Now, if it wasn't fortified, barbarians have terror. So these guys might just surrender, like, right off the bat. You go, go, go look at the rule for that. Um, but if not, they're going to have to besiege the city. And, you know, I'm not going to go into it, but just like combat and other things, like die, roll modifiers, roll dice, see what happens... You either get it or you don't. If you don't, you have to retreat one to three spaces, like all the retreats, one to three spaces. If you do get it, great. You get two gold. Well, hold on. You have to decide if you're going to loot. Of course you're going to loot. You're going to get two gold, and then you're going to randomly draw a loot token for each level of city. This one's only level one, so we only get one loot token. What, what does it tell us? It tells us we get three more gold plus event 19. It's event 19, I don't know. Go look it up. Some of them say, do something. Sometimes they're bad. I guess that might be why you don't want to loot. You always want to loot. Uh, other times, event 19 represents like an event card, but it's just in chip form. You just put it in your little pocket and save it for some you know, surprise moment. After you loot, uh, you put a little marker down, a pillage marker to let everyone else in the area know like there's no more gold to be found in this territory. And you also decide, hey, do I want to tear down these walls? If you want to tear down the walls, flip that puppy. If you don't want to tear down the walls, you keep them. Hey, enough of those land battles. Hey, let's talk about boats. What up, what's up with boats? Well, I don't know. Let me find, let me find another boat. You know, this is a red Roman. It's probably going to be hard to tell the difference. So I, I just wanted to be pretend. Let's pretend this is a boat. This is an enemy boat. So first off, you may, in a sea zone, stack up to two of your boats in one stack, okay? So that's max stackage. Other nations can have their own stacks in the zone. It's fine. At some point, one guy might want to attack the other, vice versa. It's cool, but for a while, for now, they're just chilling. If I had more boats, okay, I will go get some Roman boats, but let's pretend these are Eastern Roman, the magenta color. If I moved another one in there, it has to start a second stack. Okay, so these are two different fleets. And I can add another to make to max it out. You're done. You can't have more than two stacks in a season. When you have battle, um, only stacks battle. So I can't combine these into a, um, four ships. It's going to be two against one, pretending that's a ship, right? And it's just like a land battle with minor adjustments. You can see like this guy's a veteran, things like that. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, just, just know it can be done, all right? Um, yeah, let's put these back. Here's about these boats. Well, they could do other stuff. For example, I have two Roman legions here. 
Let's say I want them down in Egypt. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to build a bridge of boats. So we got one here, right next to these guys. There's a little port, they exit through the port. So the port has to be on the sea zone, which, oh, hmm, maybe I can't do that. All right, let's say these guys are here. <laughs> All right, there's a little port on the sea zone. Well, we need to get them over to Egypt. So we'll go one, just cost a pace to get on the boats. The act of putting them on the boat cost the boat a pace. Boats can go four spaces. So that boat is now down to three. Just memorize it, okay? Now where are they gonna go? I said I have to make a, a bridge of boats. Well, here's one up here, you can go four. One, two, three, cool. He has one move left. Uh-oh, I'm cheating. Let's put these back. Let's move our boats first, because he only has one move left and a boat absorbs a move of itself for each unit it transports. So this guy's gonna go one, two, three. Now this boat is no more moves left. Ding. Okay. So this guy's like high and dry. Where's he gonna go? Well, let's see. Let's see if he can get down there. He can go one, two, landing here, three. No, that's as far as he got. You can move, get on a boat, and then move again if you want. You can't like use a boat twice. Okay, let's do this a little differently. We've got two boats there. Got these two guys here, they're right there. They want to um, they want to travel over to Asia here, right? So they uh, a boat can actually transport up to three units. Here, let's just make it easier. A boat can actually can't transport up to three units plus a leader in one go. But let's say I'm like really lazy and I'm not gonna move these guys together. Let's do one, okay? So this guy's gonna go one, two, three, okay? So he used up all his moves. The boat has used up one move because it transported a guy. It's also done one transport. So let's turn it 45 degrees and say he's done one transport because you can only do two transports. It seems complicated, it's not that bad. I'm just horrible at explaining it. Okay, now this guy's shown up. He's like, yeah, I, I wanna get over there too. I'm, I'm dumb and I'm not moving in one stack, but whatever. Just go one, two, three. Okay, this guy used up another movement point. He still has two movement points. He's done all his transports that he's allowed to do. Still two movement points. Maybe he's gonna cruise down here with a, a third movement point, whatever. All right, so that's what boats are good for. I know, quick and dirty overview. All right, details, details. Remember I told you, this is not just a regular barbarian. That's a nomadic barbarian. Their hordes fast. What else about them? Remember all barbarians and barbarian areas are by default neutral? Uh-uh. Default hostile to everyone in the game. These guys are mean. Doesn't look very mean, but they're mean. The Huns, turn two, Huns, coming up from here. They are really mean. So when the game starts, like a lot of these guys are wanna get the hell out of Dodge because Huns are coming. But anyway, they're automatically hostile unless they themselves say, I'm not hostile. So it's a little backwards from the other barbarians where they cannot call declare hostility on their turn, but other barbarians would have to declare hostility. These guys start hostile and would have to declare neutrality on their own turn. Hey, remember when I told you this will be over in like Less than an hour. I'm right on target, yeah? You should be proud of me. So uh, remember the uh, military phase is the meat of the game, but there's other phases. Let's talk about those really quickly. Like, take 20 minutes. Time phase. First thing uh, is do the status of nations phase. So we're going to um, age our barbarians. What that means is we go to the Avum track and each barbarian nation is going to move forward on the track. They're going to get a little bit older. Any barbarians that are age three now, on the next turn, may announce they want to tr uh, transition to become a kingdom. Isn't that nice? Once they're age five, though, they have to start making a die roll check to see if they're forced to become a kingdom. This is what happens when you become a kingdom. You get some gold. You f your horde turns into a city. You get a little capital, um, and so on. Uh, but really, you get the headaches of being a kingdom. A kingdom has to collect income from their provinces and cities, they have to pay for maintenance, they have to buy troops, so you get you get some headaches, you know? Um, then, uh, kingdoms age, same deal. Except, uh, you know, they, as they age, they might start enter into decline. Yeah, going into decline, you might not be so hot. 
but uh, eventually, you know, they, they might want to transition into an empire, actually. Uh, to transition into an empire, you have to be a kingdom, but have three areas under your control. Some minor mod mods to that. Why do you want to become an empire? Well, you don't necessarily, but um, just, there's different traits for an empire. But anyway, there's also religious things called heresies. We're not going to care about them, but they age too. They are things that can impact your income. Then you get reinforcements. So the reinforcements, barbarians have reinforcements. They don't buy units. They don't uh, maintain units. They just get reinforcements. There's a timetable that tells you that. You also get new nations. So the green player, for example, on turn two is told, you get the Huns. Have fun. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's fun, huh? Draw event cards, one for each person. There are some nations that are raider nations. They're not on the map. They just like do little plink, plink, do try to loot some places. Yeah, you know, this is like where the complexity of this game comes in. It's like this bookkeeping stuff. There's some caravans, might give you some money. They're printed on the map. Kingdoms and empires get barbarian or get, get diplomacy cards. Barbarians don't. They get them depending on how cool their leaders are or whether they're an empire. Cool. I know, this is like ridiculous rules overview. I'm just giving, this is the idea of like there's someone in charge of most of this stuff and you just need to know the meat and potatoes and the general idea, right? So you got the meat and potatoes with the military phase, so I'm skimming through this. There's some stuff. This is a good one. Administration cards. I gotta stop on this one. You may have heard me say like kingdoms and maybe even I said empires. They have to collect income, pay maintenance, and purchase units. Barbarians? Nah, they just get units for free. Um, but another thing about kingdoms and empires, they have to administrate their kingdoms and empires. There's this like administration deck. This is mean. So you'll be ordered to draw a certain number of these, right? And so let's say I have to draw three or four. So I had to draw four. Well, first off, if I only had one kind, you have to keep drawing until you have two kinds, okay? So, but let's say I drew four, and I have three kinds, passive, military, and reform. I have to pick one kind, okay? And if I'm a kingdom, I have to pay the crown cost. If I'm an empire, the eagle cost. Okay, so you have to have this, you have to do this before you get your income. So you have to have saved money from last turn to pay for these. If you can't pay for it, you are bankrupt, it's bad. Right, check it out. Reform is expensive, especially for an empire. Like that is a lot of money in this game. So let's say you're like, oh man, I don't have any money. Uh, I guess I got to do passive. Oh, this is awful. So you take whichever one you want, you pay the cost. Let's say we're the empire. Flip them over, and you get to pick one that is the one you bought. Um, this one's like, hey, cool, you get some money. This one's like, no calamity. <laughs> this is a, this might be an actually an okay one. There's no calamities. No calamity. Calamity, go look it up, but sounds it sounds not too fun. This is a passive card. I imagine all the passive ones have this little X next to the, the, the bust here. That means your leader has to go to the capital and just chill out the entire turn. He's very passive. Uh, I don't remember what this is, but anyway, these things, they seem mostly bad. Maybe not so much. Here, let's go check out that, just for fun. Let's check out the military one. Ooh, your leader's cool, but there's a catastrophic fire. It's not so hot. So reform, reform, like that sounds amazing. Look at all that money you have to spend to do this. You get more money, your leader's hot. There's nothing bad happening or good. I don't know what that is. No calamity, I don't know. Reform's probably the best one, I'm just guessing. So, moral of the story though, save your money, save your money, so that you can buy those. Okay, back to the horrible sequence of play uh, descriptions here. After that, you collect income. You get it from your cities and your provinces and your areas and the boats you have control over and tribute from vassals and clients and from caravans. Then you pay expenses. If you're a vassal, you pay tribute. If you're a fetus, you get three bucks. If your province is in revolt, it's minus. If there's heresies in your area, bad. If you're in decline, there's little markers you get that tell you you're in decline, you use money. Um, kingdoms have to pay one per unit. Um, so they have to maintain stuff. So that's a benefit of empire. Got a lot of units, they're free. 
recovery from pillaging, cool, you know, lots of stuff. Purchase units. In addition to purchasing units, you can spend uh, 15 gold to build fortify fortifications on your cities. Your max gold's 40. You'll often have more than 40. But remember, you got to keep your bank big enough to afford an administration card if you're civilized. Also, if your age gets really high, you start having to cut your treasury by the end of your turn. Um, maybe it's the beginning of the turn. So even if you've banked 40 gold, you might be told you have to cut it to 20 at the beginning of your turn. So you just got to be got to be careful. Revolts of duel, whatever, you know. Hey, look, made it to the military phase. So um, we're done doing like horrible rules assessment. All right. And then finally, um, well, you know, victory point phase where every three turns you score victory points. All right. Horrible rules analysis. There's a few more important things for gameplay. Okay, we're getting there. Let's talk about controlling things, okay? First, let's talk about controlling provinces. In a barbarian area, to control a province, you need two units if you're a barbarian. So we control Gothia there. If uh, that was controlled by someone else and we move one unit in, nope. If we move two units in, we control it. The horde also counts for whatever reason. But for a civilized nation to control a barbarian area province, you need three. So it's tougher for civilized nations to control provinces in a barbarian area. Provinces in a non-barbarian area, um, in other words, a civilized area, it just takes one unit. Whether you're barbarian or civilized, it's one unit. It's easier to control civilized provinces, I guess. There's roads and people willing to submit, things like that. To control an area like Germania, well that's a barbarian area. So for barbarians, they have to have the only horde in Germania, or in the barbarian area. So if this current situation, there's actually a Frankish horde and an Alemanni horde, no one controls it. Uh, your vassals, if you have vassals, like you've um, captured a horde or whatever. Um, their hordes count as your own hordes. So um, if the Alemanni were a vassal of the Franks, then the Franks control Germania and vice versa. So that's sort of an exception to the general rule of controlling areas, which is like barbarians in a barbarian area. But barbarians in a civilized area, civilized guys in a civilized area, civilized guys in a barbarian area, this is all the same, which is well, it's almost all the same. <laughs> Barbarians and kingdoms, if they control the majority of the provinces, they control the area. So if there's five provinces and you control three of them, it's yours. Empires, they need to control cities instead of provinces, so the majority of cities. What that means is they can't control areas that are devoid of cities. For example, Germania has no cities. Now, eventually someone might build one, and then it's possible for an empire to control an area. You might be wondering, well, what if there's a horde in Germania and a kingdom has three provinces in Germania and an empire has three provinces in Germania? Well, there's a pecking order. Empires always win, then kingdoms always win, finally barbarians. Now let's say the Romans have Gothia here, right? They control, oop, that's not in Germania. We'll go to Albus, okay? And the Alemanni are the vassals of the Franks. So right now, the Franks own Germania, but the Romans have Albus. Do they? No, they don't. Gee, I'm lying to you. You need three units to control Albus, right? Because they're civilized in a barbarian area. So if these guys just like decided to walk off, tech, and these guys weren't here, they would still control Albus. You're just going to have to remember, there's no markers to let you know they still control Albus. You know, use a penny or something, whatever. Um, but let's just say the, these guys were here. The Franks control Germania. Since they control the area, any unoccupied places revert to the area controller. So controlling an area helps you control provinces. Uh, you know, military units prevent you from controlling those provinces, but if they leave, the area control will sort of seep into the evacuated province, if that makes sense. Okay, well... <laughs> I'm exhausted and that's got to be good enough. 
So, one person, if, if, if your group is going to watch this video, apologies. And you need one person that really knows the rules. That's not just people learning from this video. Um, but I think that should be good enough. Like, people can sit down and actually play. And you just go through some of the details of the little phases that I just glossed over. So, uh, good luck. What up? Have a good one.